We start in Sudan, where a three-day ceasefire between two rival military groups has come into effect to allow people to be evacuated, but there are concerns that it may not hold. Hundreds of people have died since fighting started between the Sudanese army and RSF paramilitary force. In recent days, more countries have attempted to evacuate their diplomats and citizens. This is a member of the Dutch military handing out earplugs as they get ready to take off. And this was the scene as the Spanish Defence Ministry helped diplomats and citizens onto their plane. Well, foreign governments are under pressure to do more to evacuate citizens trapped in the country, as Aruna Ayenga reports. Families fleeing Sudan, children disembark from a ship in Saudi Arabia. Kenyans arrive in Nairobi by plane. They got away from this bullets, bombings and smoke in Sudan's capital, Khartoum. Fighting broke out 10 days ago between the army which controls the country and the paramilitary rapid support forces. Amar Osman from Dunfermline in Fife filmed this. He was visiting relatives in Sudan when the fighting began. People going in their houses with guns and taking everything, their phones, their money, their food. So it's getting, it's getting, it's getting wild. We were expecting some arrangement to be made, at least by the British embassy, but actually no one contacted us and we, we didn't hear from anyone. Despite the fact that residents from uh, uh, other countries, they already evacuated their people. I don't know what's going to happen. The current ceasefire should allow for people to leave, but there are fears it won't hold. Three previous ceasefires have failed. Others say even if the bombardment stops, getting out isn't a straightforward task. The challenge for the UK and to the US is the sheer numbers of people. Um, the Europeans have been able to get out hundreds, and had it just been one flight or two flights, the UK could have done the same thing if it only had to deal with a few hundred people. Um, when you're dealing with up to 4,000, all of whom have got to be collected from individual houses, you may not know where they all are. Some will be infirm or old. There will definitely be children involved. The risks are so much larger and the window that you need to move that 4,000 people has to be longer. So what are the possible routes out of Sudan? Some have been evacuated by air. They've boarded buses in Khartoum and driven 20 miles north to a small airbase at Wadi Saidna. From there, they've been flown largely to Djibouti. Others have gone by sea from Port Sudan on the coast. Other foreign nationals have tried to escape by land through Egypt in the north. And Sudanese too are on the move. These coach passengers are from Omdurman, Sudan's largest city. They're heading north into Egypt. <laughs> Meanwhile, civilians in Khartoum are being told to stay inside. But food and water supplies are running low. Aruna Iyengar, BBC News. Well, in the last few minutes, the British government has said it will help the departure of British passport holders from today, Tuesday. Seats will be allocated on a priority basis, starting with family groups with children, the elderly and people with medical conditions. They say they can only evacuate British passport holders and immediate family members. And they say they will contact those who are eligible for evacuation directly. And they've asked people not to make their own way directly to an airfield. The UK government has come under pressure for the speed of its response to the crisis in Sudan. And we can get more on that crisis now with our correspondent, Myani Jones, who's in Lagos for us. Myani, potentially very welcome news there for British passport holders and their family. Um, lots of evacuations have been demanded recently. We know that supplies are low in the country, things like food supplies in Sudan. There's an urgent need for a lull in the fighting. Uh, this recently announced ceasefire has given a lot of people hope. Is there any indication that it's working? Uh, at the moment, we're getting a mixed picture out of the capital, Khartoum. Um, some people saying where they are is pretty quiet. We're hearing in north, the north of the city, uh, the ceasefire doesn't appear to be holding. People say they can hear some fighting in the distance. And that pretty much tracks with uh, what we've seen happened in previous ceasefires. There is, There are periods, lulls in the fighting when uh, both sides are resting or perhaps praying, um, but it doesn't seem to hold all the time. 
Yes, and of course the UN Secretary General has warned that there could be this catastrophic conflagration, as he put it, that could engulf the whole region. So there's a lot at stake uh, from this ceasefire to dampen down the conflict overall. Do you think that that could happen? Listen, I mean, yesterday I spoke to the South Sudanese foreign minister and he said the fact that the fighters uh, had even stopped fighting a little bit to allow uh, diplomats to leave over the weekend was a sign of progress and showed that uh, they could be negotiated with. So I think optimism is always a good thing, but uh, there's also a fear on the other side that this might just be uh, temporary, that once uh, politically sensitive civilians like diplomats, uh, like the elderly, like people with children have left the city and left other parts where there's fighting in Sudan, uh, that things might resume harder than ever. And that's a very terrifying prospect for a lot of Sudanese people. So they're also trying to make their way out. I guess this news from the British government will give people hope that they're taking this ceasefire seriously. Um, but there's key infrastructure that's been hit across the country, as we know, water pipes, the internet is down. So for those that won't be able to leave the country with the robbing and the looting, they're still living within a battlefield. Absolutely. And the news from the UK, some might see us coming too late. I definitely know of two British citizens who took it into their own hands uh, to leave the country, decided to, um, you know, hire buses privately for themselves and their families to try and get to safety. So the news of today's evacuation will be coming too late for them and they would have already braved very dangerous roads. We're struggling to get through to them at the moment. So uh, a lot of pressure on the British government to move fast to avoid more British citizens uh, deciding to take risks to get themselves out of what you've described uh, as a very difficult and very dangerous situation. And the perilous journeys that, that you describe, we're, we're hearing more and more stories of the kinds of risks people are taking and I suppose people should just expect to see more of those. Absolutely. I mean, the reality is for many people, particularly people with families, the alternative is a lot more dangerous staying home when a lot of the fighting is taking part in residential neighborhoods. Um, you know, members of the RSF, the small paramilitary group that's been fighting the Sudanese army, they've decided to take to the streets where they can hide um, and use that to their advantage when, when fighting against the army. And that puts a lot of civilians at risk. They say they're essentially being used as human shields. And that's why for many people, even though the roads are dangerous, even though there's uncertainty at the border, they'd still rather take those risks than stay somewhere where they're running out of supplies and there's fighting right on their doorstep.